All right, we are going to look at the sanctuary this morning. A couple of uh, just opening remarks regarding uh, this study. Oh, he just muted me. <laughs> you, you muted this. Testing. There we go, okay. A couple of uh, things that I want to say before uh, getting into the study. First of all, um, not everybody has the study that's, that's, that you're looking on at the, on the screen. And so, like last week, you'll just have to follow along. It's, it's in the question and answer format. Um, this is a very introductory. Um, I know you've probably seen videos and seminars talking about the sanctuary in minute detail. And so that's not what this morning is about. Um, I'm, we're just going to share some overall um, solid general information because this afternoon at 2 we're going to look at it again. And so you have to come today at, at 2 o'clock. Um, <clears throat> when we talk about the sanctuary, <clears throat> I've seen some presentations on the sanctuary, good ones and maybe not so good ones. Sometimes, uh, even in our own church, sometimes people will tend to allegorize a little bit too much that's not really merited, uh, validated in the Bible. Um, but uh, the other thing I want to say is about the sanctuary is that it's something that is very personal. Um, it's, it's, um, it has to do with how God and us in Old Testament times, it has to do with how we relate with each other. And so it's not just a box, it's not just a model, it's not just a, a schematic, um, but it has to do with um, our relationship with God, how heaven and earth are linked together through this model, and how um, salvation and sin are illustrated in this model. And um, there are some general principles we can extract from it. Again, there you can get into very, very minute things. Um, we just have to be careful not to allegorize too much. Um, so, just some opening remarks regarding the sanctuary. Again, today at 2 o'clock, um, we're going to continue with this topic. All right, so I want to, this is just a, um, an overview of what we went through the other night, what we studied the other night. If you look on there, Daniel 8 and Daniel 9 are connected with each other. Um, because of the way the visions are portrayed in both of those chapters. There's, there's a, a very intimate connection linguistically and the fact that chapter 9 interprets part of the vision of chapter 8. So those two chapters are very connected. They have to do with each other. The reason why I say that is because you see that overarching circle on the top where it says 2300 years. That comes from Daniel chapter 8. The minute details, those little tiny circles and where the red cross is, that has to do with Daniel chapter 9. And Daniel 8 and 9, because Daniel 8's prophecy is cut off from the larger prophecy of 2300 years, and Daniel 9 has the beginning point of that particular prophecy to help interpret the bigger prophecy, then it goes to reason, and I can't share scripture with you, but it goes to reason that both of those prophecies have the same beginning point. Um, and in fact, not just Adventist, um, <coughs> not just Adventist scholars, but others have concluded that uh, the, the 70 week prophecy, which are, which is this, this is the 70 week prophecy or 490 years, um, has its beginning point with one of those Persian kings. We interpret it as King Artaxerxes in 457 BC, which you see on the screen. So all of this fancy diagram, etc., has to do with the sanctuary the prophecy of this, because in Daniel chapter 8, 14, the angel Gabriel tells Daniel, um, 
that after the 2300 evenings, mornings, evenings slash mornings, then the sanctuary will be reconsecrated or cleansed. That's this. And so if we take as the beginning point this period, then that's how we get all of, all of these years. We went over this last night, and you can see um, the fulfillment of each particular section uh, the 69 weeks in one week, this is the angel Gabriel's wording. It's not mine. <laughs> the angel Gabriel says this, 69 weeks, one week. Um, after, actually, actually, there's even uh, another section here with one week and 62, one week. I'm getting confused here. See, even I get confused because of all of these things. There's actually even a section here with a separate week, and then, uh, now help me out here. See, I'm trying to remember the prophecies here. Seven and 62, that's where I'm getting confused. I'm thinking one and 62. So the angel Gabriel says here there's seven weeks, which comes to 408 BC, if, if I remember correctly, and then 62 weeks. I just summarize it at 69, and then there's the last week. So all of this, is the 70 week prophecy of Daniel chapter nine. The same beginning point as Daniel chapter eight. And then you see here, the Messiah is cut off in the middle of this week, three and a half years, three and a half years. This is what happened at the end of 483 years. This is what happened at the end of the full 70 weeks. And then of course there's some time left over, 810 years to be exact and you get to 1844. So I just wanted to review that. We went over that the other night. Okay, the Old Testament sanctuary, <coughs> excuse me, and its services. This is a vast, fascinating study, one that I don't think we'll ever exhaust in, in this life. All right, as I said, it's a question and answer format following the lessons. I know not everybody has the lessons. What is to be cleansed? Assuming, of course, that you went over these verses already, for those of you who had the lessons. So according to Daniel, uh, chapter 8 and verse 14, what is to be cleansed at the end of the 2300 days? And the answer is the sanctuary. And I'm here, so I'm just going to read it for you. Daniel 8 and verse 14 says this. How long, I'll, I'll start from verse 13. Then I, meaning Daniel, heard a holy one speaking, and an other one holy said to that particular one who was speaking. So you have these two heavenly beings that are talking to each other. And the question says, how long will the vision about the regular sacrifice apply while the transgression causes horror so as to allow both the holy place and the host to be trampled? He said to me, for 2300 evenings and mornings, then the holy place will be and this is the NASB version, properly restored or reconsecrated or cleansed. That's, that's the verse in question. So the sanctuary, clearly the angel says the sanctuary is the thing that is going to be cleansed. And then the second question asks, what was the sanctuary called in the Old Testament? Oh, I'm sorry, I skipped one. What was the purpose of the ancient Jewish uh, sanctuary according to Exodus 25, verse 8, one of my favorite verses in the Bible. And this is God speaking here. He says, let them make me a sanctuary that I may what? Dwell among them. Well, uh, the question begs to be asked, wasn't God dwelling with his people before the sanctuary? What's the answer, yes or no? Of course, <laughs> of course God was dwelling with his people before the sanctuary. What about Abraham? You know, God said about Abraham, uh, uh, he is my friend and you are righteous. It was credited of righteousness. Do you think God was dwelling with Abraham? Of course he was. He was dwelling with all of us. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. The, the, God, of course, was dwelling with him. Um, so apparently in God's mind, the timing and the circumstances required, or the, it was just right, that God said, I want you guys to build me this sanctuary. Now, this was very important at this point in time in the history of ancient Israel. This is very important because where were the ancient Israelites at this point? Where did they come from at this point? They just, they just came out of Egypt. 
Now in Egypt, um, archaeological evidence, nobody's going to dispute this. Uh, the Egyptians and a lot of the ancient uh, cultures in those days, they also had sanctuaries and temples where you would have a courtyard on the outside and in the very back you would have the most part, important part of the temple. That was just it. Um, and so this model is not only modeled after heaven according to the Bible, but it was, there was very similar structures in those days. And so the Israelites could relate to this, being in Egypt for so long, they could relate to something like this. However, the problem was, when they were in Egypt, um, they were so, let me illustrate it this way. I remember when I went in, 19, in 2005, I went to Mississippi. My son and I, we went with uh, the Glendale Church, where we were at the time, and we went to help rebuild after Hurricane Katrina. <laughs> and so we went to Bass Memorial Academy, we redid the roofing, we helped some homes, etc. cetera. And, um, and I really, really surprised myself because you know how they talk down in the South, right? So I went to the gas station. I went to the gas station and I, and I uh, put some gas and um, I had some change left over. I used my debit card or something and you know, I, I, I asked them for too much inside. So I went outside of the pump, there was some change left over. So I go back into the sanctuary, I mean the sanctuary. <laughs> I go back into the gas station and I say, excuse me, I have some change coming to me. <laughs> I was just, I was laughing at myself because I could not believe, why am I talking like this? Because <laughs> I had been around that culture and all the Christian Adventists were talking like this. And Pastor, you got to come over to my house and eat some of my sweet, uh, sweet potato pie. And that's the way they talked over there. And I, sh I really surprised myself that I was, it just rubbed off on me. Well, when you're in a particular place, and even though they say you can take the boy out of the country, but you can't take the country out of the boy. So I didn't stay like that, but I surprised myself. If you are in Egypt for 400 years, and generation after generation after generation, you are witnessing and you are in that culture, you are immersed in that culture, you're going to start thinking like them and talking like them. And so this was perhaps the perfect timing. God established this. It's not that he never dwelt with them, but now this was the birth of a new nation. Now it was time to talk about the special relationship that God has with his people um, and the importance of this relationship and how salvation and the future Messiah and how sin was to be dealt with. This is a very, very serious matter because, I mean, I look at this from a purely humanistic point of view. And I look at this and I say, why all the fuss? Why all the fuss about all of this? God already dwells with you. Isn't God in your heart? Yes, of course. Why all the fuss? Why all of this stuff in gold and silver? Why have to build this thing? I mean, God dwells in the heart. In fact, even Moses said this himself. He says, be circumcised in the heart. That was Moses, Deuteronomy 18 and chapter 30, if I'm not mistaken. And so God dwelling with his people has always been a matter of dwelling in the heart. So why all this fuss? I just explained a couple of reasons why he was, had to re-educate them. They had to unlearn some things. And if you're in a place so long where there's paganism and things that are not in accordance with God's way, you have to be re-educated. And um, apparently the time was right. This wasn't done, uh, you know, during Jacob's day. The, the time and everything was just right. And we can talk a lot about more of this, but I love this verse because what would God do according to Genesis chapter 3 when Adam and Eve sinned and the Bible says God arrived and it gives specific wording. God says to walk in the cool of the day 
And what did, what did he ask? Where are you? I love this. I love that passage. Because if I were God, and you better thank God I'm not God. <laughs> if I were God, <laughs> and this is how most of us would respond with something that Adam did. Adam did not just pick a fruit. It was far more reaching and consequential than just picking a fruit. I think we, in our Christian instinct, we understand that, that it was a lot deeper than just picking a fruit. What's a big deal picking a fruit? It was, it was a, a huge thing that they did, or, or picking the fruit that Eve did. Adam didn't pick it. Adam was given the fruit by, by the woman. <laughs> um, he was given by Eve. But God didn't ask, what have you done? What did you do? Wouldn't we ask for something like that? You know, the child steals all the, eats all the cookies, three dozen cookies, all in one sitting. And they're saying, oh, mom, what did you do? It's not what God asked. He didn't say, what did you do? He said, what? Where are you? And I like that statement because do you think God knew what Adam and Eve did? And do you think God knew where they were? Of of course he did. <laughs> so where are you, I think, has a deeper connotation in the sense of the connection between God and Adam and Eve. That relation, that connection. He already knew what they did. God is concerned with that connection. And he wants to dwell with people. And this verse is connected with Revelation chapter 21, <clears throat> verses 3 and 4. And God will be and dwell among them on planet Earth after God makes the Earth new. This is God's noble obsession throughout all of Scripture. It's His noble obsession. He wants to be with you. He still wants to walk in the cool of the day with you. It's, he still wants that. And He wants it so bad, He's willing to do all of this and eventually his son would be sacrificed. He's willing to go through all of that just because he wants to be with you. Amen? He's gone through a lot. You think you're going through problems in this life? <laughs> you are. I don't mean to minimize your pain and your trials. But in comparison with what God has gone through, God's not minimizing your pain either. But in comparison... It shrinks to nothingness compared to what God has gone through. Anyway, number three, what was the sanctuary called in the Old Testament? It was called the tabernacle. This is all a sanctuary. This is called the tent of meeting, this middle part. This is the big courtyard. Um, I don't know if this is to scale, <laughs> but these guys may be a little bit smaller if this was to scale. Okay, I know I get picky of those things like that. Okay, so here's the sanctuary. Um, the entrance is always on the east. That's why it's, if this was a map, there's north. This is the east side. Um, <coughs> in fact, in the lessons, it's reversed. If, if those of you have a lesson on page three, it's reversed. It should be the other way around. Um, so you have the altar of sacrifice. This is where all of the, you know, the animals were sacrificed by the people. And then the priest, you know, the person had to slit the throat, which is the most painless way to do something, by the way. Because usually if you slice, you may feel pain, but the pain really sinks in a little bit. You ever do that? You hurt yourself and the pain sinks in a little bit later? But by the time you feel that pain, you're already gone because <laughs> the blood is being drained. They didn't stab it in the ribs or anything like that or hit it over the head with a big rock. It was the quickest and most painless way for the animal the blood was drained at the base of the altar. The priest then had to cut it up and divide certain parts. And so that was all done here. This is the, the washing. Priests had to wash and wash the utensils and wash themselves, etc. They always had to wash the priest that was on duty for that day or, or priest on duty before they go into the holy place. So this is the entrance. This is the holy place. There's a table of bread every Sabbath. They would put 12 fresh loaves of bread on that table. These tables were made of the most common wood of that time, 
in that region in the desert. And what kind of wood was it? Acacia wood. Okay, it's very common wood. Um, these were made out of wood and overlaid with gold. Um, help me remember, was this solid gold? Was the candelabra solid gold? Yes? <clears throat> uh, but these were not the, the t altar of incense. This had to be trimmed every single day, oil pouring, pouring through and trimming the wicks. And so every single day, that light never went out. It never went out. It was always lit. There was always uh, um, incense. And God even gave the specific ingredients. This is how I want you to make the incense. They couldn't detract from that and add more ingredients or subtract exactly. Um, God is very particular with this whole setup. And then, of course, this was a very, very uh, thick curtain. There was no division in this curtain. Like we can draw it aside like this. No, it was one curtain. So the priest, the high priest, had to go on the side, enter into the side. And this is, of course, the Ark of the Covenant. The Bible says, I don't remember where, but it says that the poles to carry the Ark were never to be removed were never to be removed. And the Bible says, and if you ask me, I'll just have to look it up later, the poles were barely sticking out from underneath the curtain. Were barely sticking out. So I don't think if this was a curtain, I don't think the poles were like this. You could see the poles sticking out from the bottom. That's why in some artist's rendition, the poles were on the, the loops on the legs of the ark were towards the bottom. So the poles slit on the bottom, not on the top as some, that's how I believe it not on the top upper part of the Ark of the Covenant that some pictures will show. It was on the bottom. In fact, if you carry it, when the priests, uh, uh, and not the priests that would minister in here, there was another group of priests. I don't know if they were the Kohathites. I don't remember which one. There was other, uh, not priests, excuse me. There were other Levites that were in charge of carrying the Ark. Well, if you carry the Ark and the pole is on the bottom, then it's very prominent when you're carrying it, right? Because the ark is up, although it was covered. Nobody could see it. But anyway, so this is the sanctuary. Um, and so I want you to re remember this because I'm going to quiz you later today, okay? <laughs> All right. So in this part is Jesus' sacrifice, symbolizing the sacrifice of Christ. And in this part is the intercession because this is an ongoing, this is ongoing. Um, the uh, incense, you know, you think of, that verse in Revelation, our prayers arise like incense along with the smoke of the incense before God. Um, and then, of course, the Ark of the Covenant. This is the most inaccessible, privatized portion of the entire sanctuary. Okay? Um, in my closet, I have some of those. Uh, in your closet, you may have a, one of those storage boxes or a safe with very important documents in it, either passports or original social security cards or birth certificates. You may, I hope you don't just put them in your top drawer, <laughs> right? We usually have a special place where we put very, very important things, insurance policies, wills, testaments, that type of thing. We usually put them in a very, very important place, right? Because they're important and you don't want anything to happen to them. It took quite a bit to get from this point to that point, not only in distance, and you saw, so it's not like you're walking a mile or anything, obviously, but also in frequency. You just do not go in here every day, once a year, and on top of that, only one particular individual went in there only once a year. So this is the very, very sacred part of the entire system. And it just so happens that in that sacred part, you have the Ten Commandments of God. And on top of this ark, it had this, it, there was this lid, and they called that lid the mercy seat. What's interesting that is on the Day of Atonement, I'm going ahead of myself, on the Day of Atonement, the high priest would sprinkle blood seven times. He'd have to put blood on his right earlobe, He'd have to put, on the Day of Atonement, he had to put blood on his right big toe. And he'd have to sprinkle blood on the mercy seat. So the blood and the mercy seat was covering the Ten Commandments. It was covering the law. Not that the law is not important, but thank God 
there's mercy <laughs> in connection with the law. Anyways, so this is the sanctuary. Let's, and here's another, uh, the tabernacle in Moses' day. Here's just a, a cutout. Um, beautiful uh, linens. Here's the curtain. This is just a cutout, but there was angels woven of gold into these curtains. And of course, you've seen some presentations where the sanctuary colors represent some. Philo of Alexandria, um, he lived, oh, Philo of Alexandria was like uh, first or second century BC. Um, <clears throat> Alexandria was in Egypt, it was the northern part of Egypt. And from that northern part of Egypt, they called it the school of allegory. And even today, as I said earlier, even in some of our circles, I have seen some preachers just allegorizing to death certain things in scripture. And each of them, uh, excuse me, where did, where did you get that interpretation? <laughs> um, but Philo of Alexandria, he went overboard. And he would say something like, well, the red in some of these materials symbol, uh, symbolized um, I think he said the red symbolized air, or no, uh, air. It would symbolize air. And all of the linens symbolized earth. Or in the Bible do you get those kinds of interpretations? You know, and I think I, I well, there's a little bit of a file a little bit later on. When a person sinned, oh, let me go back to this. So you see, you see the Ark of the Covenant here, and you see, what is this? Altar of incense, candelabra. Yep. And then, of course, these, this whole uh, meeting place, the uh, tent of meeting, was enclosed, was enclosed with boards, like big plywood boards. Not plywood, but it was enclosed with boards. And then they'd be connected with these poles that were overlaid with gold and silver. And then there was hooks on the top. And so this was like a Lego set, okay, because it was portable. You could take it apart like Legos and they were numbered and etc. and you can put it back together when it was time to leave. This was a lot of doing. This was a lot of doing. It took them time to make this and of course all the materials etc. that they got from Egypt as booty. That was pretty cool. Number four, when a person sinned in ancient Israel, what was that person to bring to the sanctuary according to Leviticus 5 and verse 6? What were they to bring? They were to bring a lamb to the sanctuary. So when an individual in ancient Israel sinned, he brought this lamb. The sanctuary is the place where forgiveness of sins was obtained for people. The sinner confessed to sin over the lamb. Then the lamb was slain on the altar of burnt offerings, which you saw that big altar. Then the priest took the blood of the lamb, sprinkled it before the veil by the altar of incense, symbolically transferring the sin from the sinner to the lamb, from, to, from the sinner to the lamb, to the sanctuary. There's a lot of symbolic transferring going on here, a lot of it, <clears throat> okay? Okay, so the fulfillment of the sanctuary, we're going into a different section in your lesson. I'm gonna speed up here. Number five, how did Moses design the tabernacle according to Exodus 25 verses nine and 40? How did he design it? According to pattern, this is God speaking to him personally when he was on Mount Sinai. Make them, make them after their pattern which, which was showed thee in the mount, that's Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai, okay? So he was, I don't know how God did this. Did God go, and then it stayed in the air for an hour? Well, Moses was the writing uh, instructions and you know, Moses, God was dictating to Moses the measurements, the materials, the placement, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but this is, it was according to a pattern that was shown him. Of what was a mosaic sanctuary? A pattern according to Hebrews, the example, quote, the example and shadow of heavenly things. The example and pattern of heavenly things. Um, I don't know if you can read this. Many people envision a heavenly temple in terms of an earthly one. Apocalyptic thinkers and diaspora Jewish thinkers thought God's earthly temple as merely a model of the heavenly and or eternal one. Here's Philo. He lived in the first half of the first century, found abundant allegorical significance even in the details. The early Greek philosopher Plato, he died in 348 BC. A lot of the Jewish thinkers by Jesus' day were influenced by Plato, by the way, and to this day, Christianity is still influenced by Plato's philosophy of 
the earthly world as shadows and the true realm of ideas above. That's called dualism. So the material and earthly will waste away. It's gone. It's, you know, it's evil, inherently evil, and it'll waste away. But the true is up in heaven. This is Plato. The, the virtues um, are true, and those are immortal. We, there's a, a mortal sphere, and there's an immortal mortal sphere, which is why Plato came up with the idea of an immortal soul. An immortal soul. And to this day, Christianity still believes in that. And if you read the good books, don't read the popular books. Read the scholarly books. They'll all tell you the same thing. In Old Testament Jewish thought, there is no such thing as an immortal soul. There is no such thing. It's just not found in the Hebrew Scriptures. And then, of course, Babylonians, Canaanites, and others had modeled earthly temp uh, temples after what they believed heavenly ones. And so this concept of a model after a heavenly one, it's nothing really outside of uh, something strange. It, it really wasn't, and it isn't. And so the Bible uh, confirms this, that this was done after a heavenly model. How many sanctuaries are there in Scripture? This is sort of a trick question, <laughs> almost. There's like four or five. You know, you have the first one, then you have Ezekiel's and Rubabel's, and one of them was never built. Then you have Herod's temple, and then you have the, the um, um, what else? Anyways, how many sanctuaries are there in Scripture? Well, there's two of them. There's two of them. In the interest of time, that verse basically says, says there's an earthly one, and there's the heavenly one. Of course, there was more than one earthly one. The one that you just saw on the screen, what happened to that one? Moses. What ever happened to it? What? Replaced. Yeah, it was replaced. Um, I don't think the Bible talks about what happened to all of those materials, the seal skins and all, the, all that stuff. It was taken to Shiloh when the, when the Israelites eventually, under Joshua's leadership, went into Canaan. All of this stuff was taken up to Shiloh, Moses' tabernacle. But I don't know if the Bible talks about whatever happened to all of those original things, um, except for the uh, you know, Ark of the Covenant. But when Solomon comes along, he doubles the size <laughs> of, the, of the sanctuary. He basically, and he adds things to it. Like in the most holy place, Let's see, this is, my guess is this ceiling is about 12 feet high. That's my guess, about 12 feet high. Uh, Raul, what do you say? It's about 12 feet high. Well, in the most holy place, there was not only the Ark of the Covenant, but Solomon created these two gigantic cherubims made of olive wood, and they had wings, and they were 15 feet high. So two big figures, and their wings stretched out, the outer wings touched the edge of the most holy place, which was 30 feet wide by 30 feet deep. Their wings in the, their inside wings touched each other, and there was the Ark of the Covenant right at their feet. So when the, when the high priest would come in on the Day of Atonement, he's like, whoa, these things were overlaid with gold. Huge, monstrous figures with the Ark of the Covenant in the middle. Uh, it's just, it's cool reading to, I mean, just to imagine uh, the temple during Solomon's day. Uh, minister of the sanctuary, whoops, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. This is clearly indicating that there is a heavenly sanctuary that God made, which begs the question, why would there be a heavenly sanctuary? Why in heaven would there be a holy place and a most holy place, why in heaven would there be a necessity for something like that? You know, uh, those are interesting questions. I remember when I was in the seminary, one of my professors said, and I don't remember the verses, he's, um, again, nobody really knows a, all of this stuff before sin entered, but I remember him saying, and he used some verses, perhaps it was more like, I don't remember his words, but I'm thinking like a sender of praise and exaltation. Um, but sin really alters everything. Okay, let's go on. Who is the high priest of the heavenly sanctuary? 
Yes, of course, it's Jesus Christ. And how many mediators are there between God and people in New Testament times? How many mediators? That's right, there's one. There's one mediator. And who is that mediator? Jesus. Pastor Ray Navarro. <laughs> of course, there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ. One single mediator, which is why Protestantism um, adamantly denies the teaching that there is, uh, with all due respect, uh, that there is Jesus' mother and saints mediating um, in heaven on our behalf because of what this verse, because of what Paul told Timothy here. There's only one mediator. Remember that. There's one mediator. Now, there may be human helps, right? We pray with each other, we counsel with each other, etc. But as far as mediating in the sense of a connection that you can have access to God through a human, it's, there is no such thing. You have access to God through Jesus. Jesus never said, Peter, you are the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through you. Jesus never said that to Peter. He said that about whom? Himself. About himself. About himself. Let's look at Jesus and the fulfillment of the sanctuary. Go to Revelation chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. Revelation 1, verses 5 and 6. Um, John is seen in vision Jesus himself. Revelation 1, verses 5 and 6. This is what the Bible says. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. And he has made us to be a kingdom, priest to his God and Father. To him be the glory and the, min the dominion forever and ever. Okay? Jesus himself fulfills the sanctuary service. There's other verses um, I want you to turn your eyes to verses, the last verses. Look at verse tw uh, 20. As for the mystery of the seven stars, which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. It's interesting that in these verses, in the context of chapter 1, Jesus is walking in the sanctuary among the lampstands. And those lampstands are the seven churches, the Bible says, and the stars are the leaders of those seven churches. So when you read Revelation chapter, the book of Revelation, you're reading other churches' mail. <laughs> because the book was meant for seven churches originally. Of course, we learn all kinds of things from, from the book of Revelation. Uh, question is, what phase of Christ's ministry is symbolized by the work of the courtyard with its altar of burnt offering? According to those verses in Hebrews and John, he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And then John says, the Apostle John says, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Jesus is clearly depicted in Scripture as the one who can deal with sin on a permanent basis basis and takes away this and he is dealing with the sin problem personally and physically by altering his very nature to become a human being it's not like the old sanctuary system where animals were used and animal blood how does jesus fulfill the ministry of the holy place in hebrews 9 verse 24 the bible says for christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Remember that other verse that Christ pitched, you know, you pitch a tent. Christ pitched a heavenly sanctuary that man did not. There is a sanctuary up there. We don't know the dimensions. By the way, I'm glad I said that. Because don't think that the dimensions of the earthly sanctuary, you know, 75 feet wide and 150 feet long in Moses' day, and, you know, the most holy place was a cube. The most holy place that Moses did 
was 15 high, 15 wide, 15 deep. In Solomon's temple, it was double that, 30, 30, 30. But don't think that those dimensions are literally those of the heavenly sanctuary. Are you kidding? It just, it just can't be. It was a miniature, minuscule model um, that was made by hands and it had its earthy, man-made aspect to it. But I can hardly wait to go to heaven, amen? And see the glory up there. I mean, it's just, when I was a kid, I used to love to do uh, models, you know those car models? When I was a kid, um, you know, Caprice, now I'm dating myself, <laughs> Chevy Caprice and you know, the, all these cars, they're about, you know, about the, like 124th scale. You can make them look very, very good, but it'll never match the original. Just never, 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 never. In size and scope and quality and function, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, number 12. How does the Apostle Paul indicate that individuals are restored to a right relationship with God, according to um, Romans? And he says this. We are reconciled to God by the death of his son and saved by his life. Amen? Amen. We're reconciled to God by this one meteor, mediator, Jesus Christ. Let's look at the Day of Atonement. Um, this was a very, very, this was a high day in, in the ancient Jewish economy. Um, so what happened on the Day of Atonement in the sanctuary? The Bible says they, uh, the priest shall make an atonement for you to what? To cleanse you. Now, this was, uh, this was once a year. This was once a year. You mean you weren't cleansed on the other 359 days of the year? A Bible year is 360 days. You mean you weren't cleansed on the other days? When you brought all of those sacrifices? You know, maybe you went, uh, you know, a couple of days or a week without deliberately sinning, nothing that you knew of. But so, you know, maybe you brought a number of offerings, uh, not burnt or thank offerings, but, you know, sacrificial offerings, sin offerings, guilt offerings. You mean you weren't cleansed on those days in February and March, only on the Day of Atonement in September? It's a September, right? When the Jews... Is it October? October, September, October. The Yom Kippur. Um, you know, what about then? This gets to be extremely fascinating in trying to wrap our minds around this concept. Um, but we do know that on the Day of Atonement, there was a special service done to cleanse the people from their sins. And not only that, to cleanse the sanctuary. Okay, there was two goats that were chosen uh, on the Day of Atonement. Okay, um, there was two of them. One, look how cute those guys look. <laughs> One of them's going to die, poor thing. Uh, uh, who were the two goats for? According to Leviticus 16 and verse 8, one was for the Lord, and the other one was the scapegoat. The other one was the scapegoat. In fact, we still use that word today, right? Has anybody here ever been used as a scapegoat? Don't you hate that? <laughs> Everybody puts the blame on you. You're the scapegoat. It even happens in churches sometimes. People are the scapegoat or, you know, there's false information or rumors or, uh, or you don't have the whole, excuse me, the whole story. And then uh, before you know it, a person is used as a scapegoat. Um, but there was one for the Lord and there was one for the scapegoat. Now, what happened, according to the Bible, what happened to the Lord's goats, the one chosen for the Lord? What happened to it? It was sacrificed. Exactly. Offer him the second goat or the Lord's goat for a sin offering. So it was sacrificed on that altar right there. Blood drained. Um, and it was sacrificed when the high priest confessed the sins of the people over this goat. Everybody. Thousands of people. So that goat was way down with sin. <laughs> that goat was really symbolically, he was crushed symbolically under the weight because everybody's sins, including the priest himself, high priest himself, were confessed over this one goat. So in a metaphorical sense, that goat was just crushed 
It was guilty as guilt could be. Guilty of all of the sins of everybody. That one goat, poor guy. It's better to be dead than alive carrying around that guilt. This is symbolic of Christ who bore the sins of the entire planet. And he was just crushed under the weight of realizing he was taking all of the sins upon himself. Paul says, he who knew no sin became sin for us. That is unimaginable. We do not and cannot, I believe, in this life fully appreciate these statements. It's, uh, it's unbelievable, unbelievable that the master and creator of the universe would do something like this and become sin for us even though he knew no sin. How would you like to be the scapegoat of everybody at work? Everything at work or at home is your fault. Everything's your fault all the time, all the time, all the time. Unfortunately, there's some children that grow up, unfortunately, in homes like that and they have to deal with psychological issues later in life. But how would you like if at home or at work Everything that goes wrong is your fault. Everything. You weren't even there and it's your fault. You were homesick and it was your fault that this messed up in the office. How would you like that? To be the scapegoat every single day in every place. That's what the scapegoat is. Or, or that's what this offering is. He took on. Now, there's a scapegoat. Where did the priest sprinkle the blood of. This is the Lord's goat we're talking about. Where did the priest sprinkle the blood of the Lord's goat? Upon the mercy seat. And I was saying, this is the lid that covers the box inside of the Ten Commandments. Uh, a stick that we call Aaron's walking stick. His rod. And it had freshly bloomed almond blossoms on it. I don't think those things ever went. It never died. And then, of course, you had a sample of the manna. <coughs> In there, but it was, of course, the Ten Commandments. And this is the mercy seat. It was a lid. That lid could come off. And those angels there are made of solid gold of one piece. It just comes off. It's a cool piece. Um, okay, so this goat paid the price by losing its life. In the Old Testament sacrificial system, an animal lost its life as a substitute for a human as a sin offering. Okay, that's that goat. Now the sprinkling of the blood of the Lord's goat on the mercy seat was to make atonement for what part of the sanctuary? And the Bible says in those verses, the holy place, <clears throat> they had to sprinkle the blood. Um, this, was, this was in verse Leviticus 16, 16. Do you believe me? Let's read it. Leviticus 16, 16. Just the other night, I, um, I uh, invited somebody to read that chapter because this is the chapter regarding the Day of Atonement. Leviticus 16, 16, the Bible says this, He shall make, this is the high priest, He shall make atonement for the holy place because of the impurities of the sons of Israel and because of their transgressions in regard to all their sins. And thus he shall do for the tent of meeting which abides with them in the midst of their impurity. So this is sort of the mysterious part that the holy place should need to be cleansed because of the impurities and transgressions and sins of the Israelites. So in other words, there's, as I said earlier, there's a transfer going on. When we confess our sins in those days, <clears throat> they go on an animal, the animal is sacrificed, the blood is sprinkled, and now, in, as we talked about last night, there's this presence of sprinkled blood because of sin. So in a sense, the sanctuary is tainted, which is thus the reason for the Day of Atonement once a year. How many of you, don't raise your hand on this one. <laughs> How many of you regularly sweep or vacuum underneath your bed? 
Get all those dust bunnies from out under there. Okay? It's as if you never, ever sweep or vacuum under your bed. And then once a year, you have to look under, holy smokes, there's my socks. <laughs> and you can barely see them because of all the dust under <laughs> there. You clean everything else out. But in a metaphorical, symbolic way, the sanctuary was filthy. It needed to be cleansed once a year because of this transfer aspect of these sacrifices. Why does the holy place need to be cleansed? Uh, because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel, their transgressions, and all their sins. What happened to the live goat when the work of the cleansing of the sanctuary was complete? What happened to the live goat? Okay, the live goat, the sins were also confessed over the live goat. Okay? So they are symbolically removed, but it was sent away into the wilderness by a very able, fit man, athletic type of guy. And he had to go take the goat. You think he took the goat like from here to across the street? Think he did that? Then why would the Bible say we need a fit man to do this? Outside of the camp of the Israelites. Because if I were to leave my dog uh, three blocks down the street, what do you think my dog's going to do? probably going to come back home, right? Um, so this person had to take this goat way out there. There's no cars, there's no quads available in those days. He just had to walk and walk and walk and walk. The Bible doesn't say exactly how far, just like way out in the wilderness someplace and just leave it there. And I know some of the animal lovers present here, poor thing, poor little goat is going to die all by itself. How's it going to eat? How's it going to survive? Well, that is the point. It is, does not die via sacrifice for someone else. That's not how this goat dies. The goat dies on its own. There is no ritual, there's no ceremony, there's no system in place in this whole thing that can redeem that goat. There's no system in place. Because what the sanctuary teaches us is in order to deal with sin, there must be a death, a sacrifice, as long as one confesses their sins and then the sacrifice is for the one who confesses, correct? That's, that's what the lesson is here. This particular goat, the sins may be confessed over it, but it is not sacrificed. And the blood is not shed for the purposes of purification. That's not what this goat is about. It's interesting. So it goes out into the wilderness and it eventually dies on its own. The blood is never shed. Therefore, there is no cleansing. There's no sacrifice attached to this one. It's very, very interesting. Okay, and I know what you're saying. Pastor, bring it home. Say it, say it, bring it home. I'll come this afternoon. The sanctuary has symbolized for us three phases in the ministry of Christ. One, his work of sacrifice is completed on the cross. Um, number two, his work of intercession began when he ascended into heaven and sat down on the right hand of God and is continuing until he comes the second time. Aren't you glad Jesus is our mediator? Amen. I am too. And uh, that old system that we're talking about was faulty. This is what the book of Hebrews says. It was faulty. You may be thinking, how can God create anything faulty? Well, it was faulty in the sense that the whole idea of an animal an animal, an animal replacing you F flies in the face of we being created in God's image. If we are created in God's image, what animal can aptly represent you? You tell me. An ostrich? A penguin? A turtle? A scorpion? An elephant? There is the eagle. Oh, it's got to be the eagle because the eagle is glorious and it's just, it's a, the lion. Oh, of course, the lion. 
Got to be the lion. Or a nice warm puppy. No animal can aptly represent you and take your place. Impossible. Much less its blood represent your blood. And so in that sense, the Old Testament sacrificial system and sanctuary was faulty. That's what the book of Hebrews says. Until a better covenant came along, which all of this pointed to. And then number three, his work of final judgment dealing with the removal of sin. This all ties in to Daniel chapter 8. That's why we spent so much time talking about the sanctuary. Because the Day of Atonement was a day of judgment. It was a serious day of judgment. And uh, everybody, it was a very solemn day. By the way, it was, a, it was a ceremonial Sabbath. So the Bible says, because you could not work on the Day of Atonement, which fell on any day of the week, depending on the year, um, it was also considered a Sabbath. So you could not work and go about your normal business in those times on the Day of Atonement. Um, excuse me, forgot to turn my phone off. You couldn't do that. And so it was known as one of those ceremonial Sabbaths, not the weekly Sabbath, the ceremonial one, because it, it could, might happen on a Wednesday. Day of Atonement, this year Moses, is on a Wednesday. You know, the fourth day of the week. Sunday, Monday, yes. <laughs> okay, so it's symbolized by the work of the most holy place. Thus, the cleansing of the sanctuary ref refers to Christ's final work of judgment in the heavenly sanctuary, because that's what Daniel is talking about, heavenly sanctuary. Number 21, we're winding down here. This is the last one. When does Christ perform this final phase of his ministry, the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary? That's how we started this morning. At the end of the 2300 days, according to the prophecy of Daniel 8, 14. Okay? Um, and those of you who have the lesson, read the note that follows the lesson. So sum it up. Today's lesson, we have learned that there are two sanctuaries, an earthly and a heavenly, that Jesus is a fulfillment of the ancient Jewish sanctuary. The ancient Jewish sanctuary foretold three phases of uh, the ministry of Christ. There's those three, uh, three phases right there, the sanctuary. And number four, we are living in the anti-typical day of atonement uh, judgment. And number five, probation is still open. Probation is still open. Because on the Day of Atonement, you can still confess your sins. There were still sacrifices on the Day of Atonement. By the way, on the Day of Atonement, the holy place rituals, the trimming of the wicks of the candelabra, the altar of incense, etc., those kept on on the Day of Atonement. It's not like everything was canceled. The priest still had to do those things on the Day of Atonement. <laughs> So even on the Day of Atonement, there was a chance to confess and to be right with God. Okay, so today at 2 o'clock, we're going to look more at the judgment um, and the sanctuary. Amen? So why don't we all stand and close with a, uh, uh, our closing hymn for today. And open your hymnals to number 590, please. Number 590.